Yeah. I got this catheter and they want it out of my chest. I don't uh -huh. know. I uh -huh. I I'm itching all the time. They say my phosphorus is high. I just don't I I don't know what else to say. I don't really know what else to do. But I I, I try to keep it intact. I try to keep it clean. I'm trying to wait for my arm to mature, mature with my fistula in it. But this catheter, I mean, I want to shower. They said I can't take a shower. I I feel dirty. I mean, whatever little bit of water and wipes I'm using is just, uh, I don't know what else to do. You know, so I... Uh, I just keep trying. I just keep trying to see what they're going to say or what they're going to tell me. And at this point, I'm just itching, scratching, and digging. Oh, all right. Uh, because this is the Lisa Baxter Show, giving you the full one one in the kidney world. And boy, guys, I tell you something else. It's been a challenge on the night. It's been a challenge since I've been doing the Lisa Back show for eight years, especially when I've been doing this live stuff for about seven, eight months. It's been a true challenge, but I am so glad to see you on tonight. I got a fabulous, wonderful guest that's also going to be on tonight. But before I introduce my guest, I uh, want to say and tell you and show you a couple of things. All right. All right. So sit up, sit good. I don't know if you guys ever do anything with crocheting or knitting or anything like that, but this is how it looks when you are you're crocheting. That's the single. And it gets bigger and bigger. Um, this is a whole different show, but I'm saying that to say this. Sometimes you need a hobby. Sometimes you need something to do. Sometimes you need to do or try something else. See, this is a nice color. This gives you something to do. This is your crocheting needle. You can be surprised, but you can make a scarf, a hat, something for yourself, something for your family. Maybe you're doing the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the when it's not Christmas kind of thing, you know, you can make your own gifts. So arts and crafts is not just therapeutic, but it's something that you can make for yourself or somebody that you love. So don't you dare ever, ever, ever forget that. And one more thing before I tell you about my guest. I don't know if you ever did hook rug or latch hook type of work, but I wanted to show you this. This is cute, isn't it? It's a Winnie the Pooh one. They got different kinds. You can make your own. You can spell out your name if you want. It could be a rug for your wall, a rug for the floor, something that you do. Very much therapeutic. This is the needle hook that you use. This is some of the colors and stuff that you use. So you get an idea. So let me show you what it looks like. I did just a little bit so you could see it. So I don't know if you could see the whole print, but I did want you to see that. That's the back, and this is the front. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that nice? Sometimes we need something to do. I don't know if you're bedridden or you don't have family or you're home alone or anything like that. A hobby can go a million different ways, all right? It can even teach you a little something something. How about that? Well, I hope you've learned a little something from it. Later, I'll go into detail, you know, on a different platform where I can actually show you how to crochet and knit because the show is only 30 minutes long. How about that? Well, anywho, I got an excellent, excellent guest for you. Man, it's not only, uh, what do you call it, Diabetes Awareness Month, but this nurse is excellent, wonderful, fantabulous. Um, oh my God, I just know her for longer than a minute. This is the great Crystal Matthews, she's a MPARN nurse manager at Well Cornell Medical uh, Center. And I am so proud and so glad to have her on the Lisa Baxter Show. I never thought I'd get her, but I got her now. Crystal! Hey, Crystal, welcome, girl. Thank you so much for inviting me this evening. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. I'm just glad to have you. You, man, I am just so stoked and happy and 
poof, glad to have you on the show on tonight. We're going to blow some people's mind tonight with the great and wonderful things that you're going to say, do, and, and talk about along with me. We're just going to have a conversation. We're just going to kick it up a notch. How about that? Sounds great. Wow, wow. So, mm, how long have you been a nurse? Wow, uh, this year marks my 11th year as a nurse. Uh -huh. um, when I became a nurse, I started straight out of nursing school directly into the burn ICU at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital, the William Randolph Hearst Burn Center. So I had wow. a lot of great experience. I was in touch with a lot of great nurses and learned so much. So it's great to have been able to continue to use that in my journey as a nurse now. Wow. Wow. Well, okay. So you've been a nurse for a minute. Mm -hmm. You've learned some things as a nurse. Mm -hmm. From what you told me, you specialize and you're a certain type of nurse. So run into telling me what type of nurse are you? Okay. Sure. Uh, now that I actually oversee outpatient clinics, I oversee an endocrine clinic. So uh, the majority of our providers are endocrine providers. So they deal with uh, people with a lot of endocrine conditions, namely diabetes. Uh, the majority of our patients are diabetic, even though there are some that are seeing providers for other things, thyroid issues, parathyroid issues, uh, but the majority of our patients are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. Wow, wow. So that have to be interesting because, you know, I mean, my mother was diabetic. I had some siblings that dealt with diabetes as well. I know what it is to deal with a, a thyroid and a parathyroid. I had a thyroid issue when I was heavier when I got married and all years ago. And um, I couldn't lose any weight. I had a hard time losing weight. And uh, with the parathyroid thing, with being on dialysis 12 years, they had to take, uh, they told me they would take part of it and put a piece of it or something in my arm. And, you know, so I guess it can recognize whatever that's being done, you know, um, when it came to, um, dealing with dialysis it had uh my um my pth was extremely high it went to four thousand, and it started making problems in my joints and my bones so i just said that to say this you know between thyroid th 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 thyroid and parathyroid i touched a little bit something with this when you are dealing with somebody with a thyroid uh condition what do you guys usually would have to deal with if, if they came to your clinic well, first and foremost, the providers are going to check to make sure that they have a complete blood panel done. Um, okay. Usually if patients are coming as new patients, they're either coming with prior medical records, they're coming with blood tests that have been done before. This way, the initial visit uh, can be spent really finding out what the issues are at hand. But I will say by the end of that visit, if, they don't, if the providers don't already have that information, they're going to order a lot of labs to make sure they can see exactly where the patient's levels are so they can put mm. the best plan of care for that patient. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you had a, I know, I guess you get different type of people deal, on, on different measures of dealing with di, diabetes. Mm -hmm. So you have any diabetes uh, patients that may be uh, as a bad diabetic or follow the program or lost the lamb or what have you oh yes we we have we run the gambit we have those that are really compliant who are more than on top of their health and staying in touch with their their blood sugar levels and all and we have some that are aren't compliant at all Ooh. to the point where uh yeah it's affected their sight um, it's affected, yeah, their their limbs. So some have lost limbs, had some partial amputations. Um, some who actually have some partial blindness, if not complete blindness. Uh, right. It really affects people differently. Those who have had to go on dialysis because their kidneys are led to kidney failure um, and severe kidney damage. So it really does depend. But for those who kind of stay on top of their health, it's great because they end up partnering with the the doctor to make sure that their help is their help is at the top of the list. And there's a lot that can be done these days if patients oh. want to take an active role in their own health. Wow. Wow. 
Well, I'm glad to hear there's something that can be done because you said some of them experienced kidney failure, which was going to lead to my next question to you. Because, I mean, kidney failure can be a serious, you know, jolt, you know, in life, a, a rock your world, if I should say. I can say, you know what I mean? So when you deal with those kind of people, I mean, how do you actually deal with them? I mean, what do you know about dialysis anyway? Oh, uh, well, I've, I've had some patients, even while I was still working in the hospital, we would have uh -huh. some patients who would be with us who had dialysis or who required dialysis. And because my units were more so, we took care of both extremely ill people. So we were both ICU and we were a step down unit. But for those who required dialysis, we actually had dialysis nurses who would come to the floor and would actually have their machine and get the patient set up and hooked up for whatever length of time was necessary to get their blood clean. Um, but for those patients who I know outside of the hospital who just actually go to dialysis um, several times a week, I know that it's, it's labor intensive. I know that everything revolves around dialysis. It's not like planning a trip and not being able to get your dialysis done like you that. You have a lot, yes. Of your life, you know. Mm -hmm. With yeah. that, for those who patients who are maybe new to dialysis, it's also about helping to educate them so they can really see the importance of dialysis and being able to remain compliant. Wow, yes, yes, wow. Well, okay. So dealing with your different people that you're dealing with and everything, you said they have different um, plans that help them. Can you tell me about one of the plans that you guys do to help uh, them? Sure. Uh, for a lot of our patients, um, it doesn't just start or stop with seeing an endocrinologist, someone who specializes and who can actually help them with their diabetes, but also with pairing and partnering them with a nutritionist. Excellent. Someone who can actually help them uh, either <laughs> backtrack and change some of those bad eating habits that they've developed over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that it isn't something that happens overnight, but by working together is something that can definitely be done. Uh, so they'll meet with a nutritionist who will have them complete um, a food log, what is it you're eating every day? Uh, show me a typical day of what it is you're eating to see where, if and where there are some carbs that might, might need to be cut. Maybe they're having simple carbs where they should look to have more complex carbs. Uh, just mm. taking a look at their diet to see what's going to be best for them and their health, uh, especially because there are some patients who require insulin uh, in, in order to be sure that they're not eating things that's going to really totally derail them uh, and wow. have them taking so much insulin that it's putting more of a strain on their body than necessary. So it isn't just a thing where they're just seeing the doctor. There's this nutritionist who's on board. There are a lot of different apps now. There are a lot of different videos that we can give patients to watch at home wow. to be able to really be uh, active, active participants in their own health. Well, you keep them on their toes from what I see. I mean, you tell them about apps, you, you know, you're linking them and hooking them and partnering them with, you know, the, the doctors and the specialists and the nutritionists. That is fantastic. Wow. That's what needs to be done. I mean, how else can we kind of see? Because, you know, you see your doctor and for a lot of our patients who are diabetic, uh, because it's such a chronic disease, it isn't something that just hits you. It's here today. It's going tomorrow. This is something Same. that we're dealing with over a lifetime. So for the majority mm. of our patients, we see them maybe once, twice a year. So with only seeing them those particular times a year, we have to really make sure that there's a plan in place. So that if we're not seeing you, how do you stay on track with your health? How do yep. we make it so that when we see you six months from now, see you a year from now, you haven't gotten any worse. If anything, you've been able to modify some of these lifestyles where you're really doing better. So it's wow. really important to kind of have this, this work or um, at least an idea and a plan in place where we can really kind of help patients become independent and really know for themselves what's going to be best for their health. Wow. Wow. That, that's, that's said very well. Now, you know, diabetes is uh, one of the number, re number one causes for, you know, being on dialysis and what have you. 
are there anything that you guys could try to prevent or something that you do or say or give them a heads up when it's either that crucial or on this direction that going that way? Definitely, definitely. Uh, when patients actually have their blood work done and we look at your hemoglobin A1C, which they take did. a look um, at your your the, the sugar, the blood sugar levels that you have, but it isn't necessarily one point in time. Whereas there's some patients who have like a fasting blood glucose level drawn with that, the doctor will tell you don't eat for several hours before the blood is drawn. This way we can kind of get a baseline as to what your blood sugar is. With the hemoglobin A1C, it takes a look over the last three months wow. uh, of your history to see what your blood sugar levels has been over that time. So this way you won't have a patient who will come in in the morning and say, well, you know, I just had a bagel. So of course, mm -hmm. you just had a bagel, your blood sugar level is going to be so high, but it might not be a true, accurate uh, reading for what it might normally look like for you as a patient. So based yeah. on your hemoglobin A1C and based on those values, we can tell whether some patients are pre-diabetic, whether they're already diabetic, and especially for those who are pre-diabetic um, right now, mm. the number of, of people who are pre-diabetic in the United States, there are so many patients who are pre-diabetic. Uh, that there are things that they can actually do to see that it does not uh, become diabetes itself. At that point, they can really actually get with the nutritionist, get with someone to take a look at what their diet is, what they're eating, when they're eating, exercise being such a great thing to make sure that they're exercising as well. Um, there are some patients or some, yeah, some people who might not be able to do more rigorous exercises, but there are things that can definitely be done to be able mm -hmm. to do that. They're on top of that. So this way it kind of reduces and lower the chances for diabetes. Like right now, the statistic we have is that more than 84 million U.S. adults, which is more than one in three, have prediabetes. And 90% of those people don't even know they're prediabetic. Wow. It's so important that even if we just stay on top of our physical yearly or annual physical exams, if you're going to see your doctor annually, this is definitely one of the tests that's being drawn as part of your panel. And wow. basically the doctors will be able to let you know, hey, you know, you're falling within a range where you're pre-diabetic. These are the things you have to really look out for. You need to look for these things in your diet, changing these things and, and modifying certain things along those lines. So there are definitely things that can be done where it doesn't necessarily have to become diabetes, but even mm -hmm. when it does, that's what we're here for. And, and that's what your doctor's there for. That's what... The, the health field is there for to make sure that we help you get on top of that. Yeah, because today somebody, well, Denise and church had mentioned about, you know, um, diabetes awareness month and, you know, having things checked out. I was telling somebody before, you know, cause I go to a lot of health fairs and street mm -hmm. fairs and job fairs and, and they need to, you know, check for uh, kidney disease and stuff on some of these these fairs that they're having because some mm -hmm. people do come or do show up or because their child is in that school or their daycare or Head Start, that's your chance to do it because some people never have a checkup yeah. or never hardly go to a doctor unless the job makes them go mm -hmm. or something like that. So mm -hmm. I was glad to hear that, you know, hear that even in uh, a faith-based place. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. it affects us all. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's probably one of the benefits we have with being in faith-based faith organizations that we can yeah. partner with the yeah. city. We can partner with others who have these resources so that we can actually bring the resources to the community, whereas the community might not always make it to the doctor's office. So that's you're right. going to where they are and presenting what it is we have to help mm -hmm. them with their health. So I'm looking forward to that. I know we'll be doing that next week. I know it's yeah. going to be great and we'll have a lot of information for patients, mm -hmm. but I think that's going to be really great. And it's going to be key. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You and I have been on the same committee when we had to plan stuff like this in the past mm -hmm. before. Yeah. And we had to do health yeah. fairs and stuff like that and stuff for the, the neighborhood of Brooklyn or the neighborhood of Brownsville or where we had worship together. Mm -hmm. And I know we're definitely looking to revamp that. I've been asked to revamp it. So Good. and I'm Great. partnering with a lot of uh, health professionals who we have uh, within ministry, outside of ministry, those who are just yeah. looking to be able to give back to the community. And I, I've 
And that's usually the case. People want to be able to give back. Sometimes they're just not sure how to give back. So right. it's really great, especially with uh, the number of families who we have moving into the neighborhoods. To be able that's to right. know that we're here and we're here to be able to offer both natural, spiritual, uh, just, just taking a look at every yes. area of our life to be able to make sure that we're whole. We want to be whole people. We don't want to be have a no. deficiency or a deficit in one area but we're abounding in another. We need to be balanced in all areas. So that's what we're looking to do, to see that we have balance in our lives. Yes, Dunamis was part, uh, I did work with Dunamis too, to do certain things um, also to, you know, help bring that awareness as well. Now, one time, I don't know if you, you probably remember this, one time I, I uh, my pressure went low, or, or in my shirt, something dropped, you know, I, my pressure went low. I was hungry and I passed out in the church and you were one of the nurses that helped, you know, like, you know, we have several nurses and different uh, people in our church and I, y'all had to give me something to, to, you know, to bring me around or to help me when I passed out. So I, I thank you publicly, even though I thank you privately, I definitely thank you publicly for help. Uh, in the past, working with you, helping me when I was sick. I just appreciate you 100%. Oh, you're so welcome. I mean, it's it's a pleasure to be able to serve. I really do believe that we all have different giftings, and this is my gifting, and I'm just thankful to be able to share it with others. So you're more than welcome. Well, amen. Well, we went to New Life Cathedral in Brooklyn, Archbishop Rochford, and um, one of, uh, what I was going to ask you is that what are uh, some of the things that you think that would help us better, uh, either as a, a people, as a person, or even being a professional that would bring better uh, health awareness to our communities? Uh, one of the things that, well, there are several things, but sure. one that I would find to be really, is really at the top of the list is being open, being mm -hmm. open, being honest. Uh, I find that with the younger generations, with the millennials, our generation X, our generation Y, they're more open with being able to share information, be it health information, anything at all. Whereas our parents or forefathers, sometimes we have to do so much digging just to get it out of it. if and what was the health history for our families. It's wow. a taboo to even talk about. Um, so it's really helpful when people and families can be open and honest and sharing health information. Sometimes that's the majority of it right then and there. Because at least mm. if you know you're predisposed to particular things, you know what to look out for. That, like, that's so true. Yeah, it's like I, I had to, I realized that for myself and for my family, I'll use myself as an example. Mm. Uh, on my mom's side, I realized I had several aunts and uncles who had one form or another of cancer at some point in their life. Wow. I realized, okay, this is something that's familial. This is something genetic, even if it's just on her side, but it's so important to be able to know and just to have that conversation with our yeah. family to say, hey, these are the things that I know of, but what is it I don't know about? This is just yeah. what I know of on the surface, but, and, and it's getting the elders to understand this isn't just about you. This no. is about everyone who's come after you being on top of their health and being aware and knowing what we may have to face. We may not be facing it right now, but somewhere down the line, this might be something we end up having to face. Yes. Say that. Say that. One thing about me, I'm an open book and I was glad that my mother told me about everybody on her mother's side had diabetes. My father's side had hypertension, but they also had dealt with kidney disease, polycystic kidney disease. Ah. So, even though I didn't understand that always or, or knew what to look for, you know, I'm, I'm with a vengeance for the last, you know, maybe 15, 16 years going after it, talking to my family, finding out. And some family don't want to hear it either. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to know. They don't want to be supportive. They say, not me. I don't have it. I'm what you're talking about. It wasn't over here. Don't bring that over here. You know, all kind of crazy stuff. So, yes. Yes, see so, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. You know what absolutely, I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. And I feel that when people can be honest and upfront and honest like that, th there's a point in time when we all can have our soapbox that we can get on, even in the community. Yeah. So whereas you could say, hey, 
this is something that I had to deal with and I wouldn't have known if I hadn't done ABC. And yeah. just let people know that they're not that far removed from it. Like, you know what? If this could happen to you, this could happen to me. Thank and you. Knowing that the screening, and there are things that are there. There are programs that are there. There are resources that are there. But you won't know unless you know. <laughs> you won't know you unless you, know and you look into it. You got to dig. You got to find out. Because my husband had cancer. Nobody in his family that he knew of had cancer. Wow. So... We don't know where he exactly got it from. Maybe it was food. You know, we don't know if it was genetic or whatever, but we was trying to find out or try to look. If I ever find out to this day, you know, you know, I would spread that and share that with his family, our family kind of thing. I know sometimes with young people, they figure because they're young, sickness can't touch them or uh, bother them in any way. And I try to tell them, listen, this is what's going on. I'm passing this to you. I don't just pass you the pie recipe or my cooking stuff. I'm trying to give you some more knowledge about our family, about our history. So if this hit you and it go to your child or your grandchild, you'll know how to handle it or something to do or be, at least be aware. That's true. And, you know, people, for those who may be believers, those who aren't believers, this word, you know, just says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Why are we perishing? Because we just don't know. And it's not that we don't have access to the information, but are we willing to hear and willing to take in what it is we're being, what's, what people are sharing with us? It's so wow. important. Wow. Well, do you know anything about lupus or anybody with lupus coming to your, your clinic or your, you know, because that's. Um, not offhand. I okay. did know people who have, but not offhand. But it's something I can look into and get some information for you if you'd like. <laughs> Kidney disease? Um, well, just, some of it's for the viewers because some people are looking and you don't know who's looking because these are some of the things that take the kidneys down besides mm -hmm. diabetes, your, your mm -hmm. hypertension, you got your lupus, you got your mm -hmm. kidney disease and stuff like that, lack of drinking water, you know, not taking care of your kidneys. Even though you can live with one, you don't want to kill the one you got. Definitely. And if you got two, you don't want to kill them. I got three. <laughs> two of them don't work. But you know what I'm saying? So you're yeah. right. And I will say this. You mentioning that to me, it kind of all ties into one main premise or one thing we want to keep in mind. Yes. Stay on top of your annual physical exams. Amen. Your relationship with your, your doctor. And let's just be honest. If you're not comfortable speaking with your primary care physician, your PCP, you're not comfortable with the relationship. You don't feel you could be open and share the way you'd like to share. Find another PCP. Wow. You Say that. To the point where you are comfortable sharing how you're feeling, what's going on in your body, knowing that your concerns are being addressed, knowing that if you have a question, your question isn't being brushed aside. You have to feel comfortable with talking to your provider. If you don't yeah. feel comfortable, there are things you'll end up keeping to yourself. You don't want whatever it is you keep to yourself to end up causing more harm than yes. if you shared it with your doctor. You have to be comfortable talking to your provider. If you have wow. that relationship, you're prone and you're more apt to share more where there, yeah. you may say your doctor may pick up one. You even realize that it was something that was important what your provider realizes that it is. So you have to be comfortable with your doctor. Yes, yes. Well, I ain't mad at you. I know that's right. You know, I definitely know that's right. You know what I mean? You, I had a good relationship with all of the doctors that I had. Some of them either retired on my, or on, I'm on their watch, or they, God forbid, had passed away. I had one that passed away, or his, and, and I had one that his wife died, and he wasn't the same after his wife died. But I didn't jump around, just like I don't jump around with a, with a, a hairdress or anything else. I take stuff serious, anything, anybody touching me, dealing with me, or anything that I need to, to keep up on. I try to do my best by knowing something or learning something about it, and I'm sure you know, you as well, and hopefully everybody out there as well. You know what I mean? So, you know, like you said, it, you know your doctor, get a good relationship with him, yak it up with him, you know, talk with him. I have mine on speed dial. Matter of fact, I had him on the show. You know what I mean? I remember before he became that particular doctor, he was just my nephrologist. And then he became my nephrologist and my, you know, general practitioner, my, okay. you know, my main doctor kind of thing. And I can call him and ask him or talk to him about anything, especially if I'm funny about a drug 
how the drug affect me or might mess with my anti-rejection medication. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mess with Hannah. That's what I call my kidney. No. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I know that to be right. If you had to say something to a diabetic or anybody out there that doesn't listen or conform to what they're supposed to do with their health, what would you say or how would you try to persuade them if you can? <laughs> I'll tell you what I've told some of my patients in the past, uh, mm. <laughs> my non-compliant patients. I'm like, do you like to walk? Do you mm. like to see? <laughs> like, yes. they don't think about these things all the time. I'm like, this is serious mm. stuff. You will lose your ability to do these things if you don't stay on top of your health. And it's like, it has to be important to you. But trust me, I've had this conversation with older adults. I've had this conversation with people in their early 20s. Wow. And it's like you have your whole life ahead of you. Don't impair your health more than it already is now. You hate home. What kind of quality of life do you want to have? Like, let's just say you have another 30, 40, 50 years to live. What do you want your quality of life to be? Wow. Now you got to think of more than just today and tomorrow. Yeah. That's so true. That's so true. I saw a movie years ago and this guy was a good guy. He had good things going on, but he didn't believe he did. And he didn't know by, I hate to say, jumping off a building that he would live. When he lived, he ended up being um, somebody with a disability. Nothing wrong with having a disability, but he could have walked past that because that wasn't in his lane to have it, you know, or to deal with. But he brought it there to, for him to deal with because he felt like he, you know, felt like what he felt. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes you, it's a lot of people out there to talk to mentally, spiritually, naturally to help you, even family members and friends. And, you know, somebody's listening or right. somebody should or want to listen. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you could say anything to a nurse out there, whether she's a new nurse or a seasoned nurse, what advice would you give a nurse dealing with the good, uh, and the, the rough patients or whatever type of patients they have that wonderful, great patient that they got. <laughs> Just remembering that everyone comes to the table with their own story, that you don't take it personally. Don't take the yelling. Don't take the rejection. Don't take those things personally. People sometimes are in a scared place. Wow. They're in a confused place. They really don't know, but you have the ability to pull them into a different place, knowing that first and foremost, we're their advocate. And even when they can't advocate for themselves, that's the beauty in what we can do. It's a privilege to be able to advocate for our patients. It gets rough. Don't get me wrong. It does. It becomes rough. But you got to have an outlet. you got to have balance for yourself, just like you're trying to provide some sort of balance for your patients. You have to have balance for yourself so that you can be the best nurse you can be and first and foremost, the best person you can be because it'll just shine through. Yes. It will wow. shine through. But just ha making sure there's also balance there and not taking those things personally. Wow. Now you said a mouthful. I, <laughs> I, you, you preaching over here to the choir and everything else. I'm telling you. I am telling you. Wow. It's just, I don't know. I don't know. Is there a best or a good uh, experience you've had while being a nurse or one of your favorite stories? You might have a million, but pull one of them out for me without breaking HIPAA law. Sure. Um, and, and this is one of my favorites. Um, I actually love uh, partaking or being part of medical missions. Mm. So I've had the ability and uh, the opportunity, I should say, to travel to, to many countries. Uh, as a nurse, to be able to provide care as a nurse. And yeah. um, in one instance, while I was still working in the burn unit, um, we went to Tanzania and cared for a family where there was a, um, an explosion in their home. Um, wow. There were a total of seven family members. Both parents passed away and two of the siblings passed away. So there were three siblings left alive. When we had gotten there, the fire was, the explosion was maybe the week before. So they were doing the best within their ability to care for uh, two of the siblings. And from the time we got there, the, the, the oldest son, I think he was maybe 10 at the time, mm. uh, 
wounds were infected. It, it wasn't a, a, a good look. So by the time we got there, he was really on his way out. I'm thankful that we were able to get through to do what we did. So the, the surgeons who were there with us went ahead. They uh, did surgery, whatever surgery was necessary. We as the nurses would go to the hospital. Um, we would go twice a day. So even after we cared for him, we'd go back to our lodging. We'd come back in the evening to redress his wounds and get everything squared away. Uh, and we were there for several weeks. So we started to see his health gradually improve with the care we were providing. Um, and so we ended up leaving. Uh, two years later, we were given a grant. We were awarded a grant to be able to go back, open a pediatric burn center. And on wow. that second trip, I went back as a lead mm -hmm. nurse to be able to help write policy and get some things together. And while we were there, the young man we cared for two years before came back to wow. thank us and we were able to see him there and that made the entire trip for me if nothing else happened that trip that was more than enough for wow. me and behind that and then he wanted to be a part of going back to the different villages and talking about fire prevention and for other children who had been burned to say okay you're not a fire there's nothing wrong with you this is just our new normal and being wow. able to share his experiences with them. And I realized that by our being there, we were able to pour into the life of this young man who is now there doing more, making a difference, even more back over here states. Wow. So, what a testimony. Woo. What You're an story? angel of mercy. <laughs> <laughs> ah, hallelujah. I and this is what I love about nursing is not just our lives. We're touching the lives of so many. It is so far reaching. Even after you're said, what you've said is long gone and is, is far spent and out of the way, they're still able to carry that on. Wow. That. So That's it's a beautiful great. thing. It's exciting. I love it. Wow. Wow. Well, you don't know who nurse you touched, what patient you touched, what uh, person out there you touched. I appreciate you for coming on and being on. Is there anything you think that we might have missed or didn't cover? Oh, or okay. mm -hmm. Not necessarily that I can think of. I would just say uh, stay on top of your health screenings. Uh, mm -hmm. The one, go see your doctor because if you go see your primary doctor, they'll be able to let you know based on your age, based on your weight, based on any other thing that you might have going on, any other demographic, whether you need to be screened for additional things. So just wow. see that doctor, get that squared away so that you can have whatever testing necessary. You can actually get that done. Wow. Well, you rock. <laughs> Is there anybody you want to give a shout out to out there anywhere? <laughs> out there. Out there. Out there. You, a shout out. you know what? I would love to give a shout out to all of my nurses, any and everywhere who are in it, because you know that patients need care, that patients need to be taken care of. There's so many different reasons people go into nursing. Oh, yeah. So your heart is there because you genuinely want to see people better. I want to give a shout out and congratulate and just thank all of the nurses who are there who are doing it for the right reasons to really care for patients, to see that they have a better quality of life. And I'm just thankful to be in a position that I can do the same. Wow. Wow. Well, I appreciate you, man. Wow. My, my niece Dawn is a nurse. My niece Tashana is a nurse. My niece Remathea is a doctor. Let me tell you, my nephew Timothy is a doctor. I'm just not mad at you for coming on, sharing, and being brave enough to be a hero on this show. You know, <laughs> so you have an excellent, beautiful night, and I love you, and mm -hmm. I thank you. I thank God for you, uh, doing ministry with you uh, for health and for the Lord. All and right, I thank so you as well. Thank you because you've taken your experience, you've taken your life, and you're sharing it with so many. And I know it's helping others. I know it is. So thank, thank you for being an open book as well. Oh, thank you. Wow. Thank you. I appreciate you. You have a fantabulous night, a million <laughs> blessings, and we definitely you definitely will talk. That's yeah. what happens if you don't get enough sleep. I done stumbled a hundred times on my words, but we're live. What you're going to say, what you're going to do, learn from it. How about that? But thank you again. You're I'm going to sweetly you. end the show, and I love you, and I thank you very much. You're so welcome. Yes.
Well, guys, you've heard it. You've heard about diabetes. You've heard about uh, the burn unit. You heard the success stories. You've heard about being a nurse. You've heard about prevention, protection, the hookup with the nutrition. What else could you hear on that Lisa Baxter show? I told you I was going to give you the 411. Always keeping it 1000. I love you. I see you next week. Uh, happy holidays to you. Enjoy your evening. A million blessings. Peace.